Oil services companies, some are also owning rigs and you know heavy machinery. And these these companies have been gaining uh, quite some attention lately. The, the valuation have increased a bit. We are less bullish than we were a year ago on these names. You're listening to IBKR Podcasts. Find more conversations at ibkrpodcasts.com. Please remember any trading discussions are for information purposes only and are not intended to portray recommendations. Please listen to further disclosures at the end of today's episode. Now, welcome to our show. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, week podcast. Uh, my name is Guillaume Rouchabert from Interactive Broker Singapore, and I thought it would be a very good way to start the year, uh, have this uh, 2024 with uh, my client and friend, Stefano Grasso, uh, by reviewing everything energy. Welcome back, Stefano. Hi, Guillaume. Uh, thanks for having me again. You're welcome. All right, so let's have a crack at it together, everything energy. And uh, let me start with this question, given your background within the energy practice with McKinsey at Columbia University and in oil trading with ENI. I understand you also have quite a, a lot of energy exposure with Enhanced Value Fund, your fund that you manage here in Singapore. Can you maybe help uh, give a bit of an overview of how you think about energy from an investment perspective? Sure. I think the, the starting point is the importance of energy for the world. And, uh, you know, it's not something that is nice to have. It's something that is uh, is needed and sought after really across the globe. You know, maybe some, some primary energy numbers to, to start with are, are important because typically, especially these days, we talk about uh, a lot about renewable energy, uh, which is only electricity. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, debate of uh, fossil versus non-fossil fuel. But the reality is that uh, about 80% of the primary energy use is, is, is still fossil. Uh, between oil, coal, unfortunately, and, and gas, there is a lot of uh, energy that is uh, needed uh, and uh, consumed via fossil energy. The, the energy density that is in fossil fuel is just different, difficult to replicate with, with batteries and, and other uh, technologies. We've seen the, the kind of decline of nuclear and hopefully now the, the resurgence uh, of, of nuclear uh, that uh, is going to help make the zero uh, emission transition. And, and of course, together with energy, you have also to talk about carbon emission. There is actually a, a proper market about carbon emission, and that's uh, increasing effectively the cost of producing and consuming the most polluting form of energy. And just to, to just conclude this, this very brief introduction, I think is energy is probably one of the most heated and politicized uh, sectors I can think of. And for us, at Enhanced Value Fund, that provide typically when, when there are these situations, a good uh, opportunity to approach it from a very rational and uh, data-driven, with a data-driven approach, where we try to deviate from the narratives, but just stick with the numbers. And, uh, and so what, uh, what I hope uh, I'm going to be able to you know, discuss with you today. Uh, shall we dig in a, a bit more into the subcategory of the, um, the, the sector of, of energy? You mentioned about nuclear, you mentioned about uh, also um, the charcoal uh, or the coal, which is like around 40% of the of the energy mix, if I'm not wrong. So how do you value those different like segments of, uh, of the energy sector and uh, which sector do you prefer or you like in, in particular? So... I mean, let me give you a, a, a brief overview. Of course, the, the sectors that we like the most are the sectors that have attractive valuation. So, so, so that's mainly what, what's driven our interest from one and another. Let me start by saying that biofuel, hydrogen, and other kind of innovative energy plays are a bit too risky for us. And when I say too risky, I mean... There is a lot of uncertainty around uh, technologies that are not proven and the cost of the whole values, value chain. One theme that it's also recurrent is uh, to a large extent, their success and their economics are linked to incentives. And this is very dangerous from our perspective. We want to invest in sectors and, and businesses that can make money and stand alone on their own legs without having uh, incentives. And, and now is not the case for for these innovative 
uh, energy plays. More traditional uh, sector is the utilities one. We're talking about electricity here, and you know there are the uh, kind of gas, uh, CCGT, uh, or even coal-fired uh, traditional plants, and also the green ones that produce electricity. From basically the, the, the utility install, in case of you know the renewable energy, the green installation, they install wind and solar panels, and they they get a, they're supposed to to have a sort of bonds like return because they sell electricity typically at fixed or regulated price, and they bear the risk like project development, project execution. Of course, they need to be careful with the leverage not to exceed it, but in essence they are going to get a return on the investment that should be predictable. And uh, what we didn't like a year ago was the valuation, especially given the increasing uh, interest rates. But nowadays, the, after the recent correction, uh, you saw some big players like Nextair in the US and Orsted in, in Europe coming off quite dramatically on, on the backlash of some you know, offshore cancel project in the US, especially for Orsted. And now we see valuation that are more like bond-like with a premium for the execution of the project, which we like. Before was like bond-like minus, and, and we didn't like that, that situation. So the utilities is the least exciting sector, if you want. But the good thing is that the kind of prices came off a bit. So we see value there. We also related to the this new energy production, we like to go a bit upstream uh, in the new energy sector, so to speak. So there are commodities like uranium, which, uh, you know, we mentioned nuclear before, copper, lithium, polysilicon, which is the base material for solar panel. Since they are energy related resources, we look at them under the energy hat and uh, they are quite volatile in terms of price movement but nonetheless they are in dire need and we like the supply demand balance across uh, these different commodities truth being so told is different time horizon so for example it looks like copper is probably tighter than lithium in 2024 uh, and also polysilicon is going to tighten probably in 2025 but there is a clear demand and we kind of feel it's reasonable to understand the supply demand dynamic so companies that produce this kind of commodity either mining or or you know through the technical process we keep a close eye then if we move on to the more traditional oil and gas sector Oil and gas companies are typically much more volatile because they are exposed to the underlying price of the commodity being these oil or gas. And, you know, we can divide them in four categories. One is downstream, which is the business of converting fuel into oil products. And these economics, the economics of this business is more linked to the, is a function of the demand for end products. We're not excited at, about this sector in this uh, today's valuation, but we can go back there and, and talk in more details. The next subsector in the oil and gas is the midstream, which is a business of moving oil around, oil and gas around. So our pipeline, you know, ships, uh, terminal, and these kind of assets. These guys, these companies, makes money with volume. And there is a very strong certainty about the growing demand for oil and gas, also for oil, uh, going out to 2030. Then it is debatable when it's going to peak demand. Uh, but the need for this infrastructure is kind of rock solid in the mind of everyone. And we like the risk adjusted return currently of these assets. And again, we can discuss in some details uh, uh, if you want. But the concept here is, is very predictable. The demand side and the economics are quite, quite clear and, and easy to understand. Finally, the third subsector is the upstream side of business. And here the business is about extracting the commodity out of the ground. And of course, it's a bet on the commodity price. So it might be oil or gas. The interest that we have is like less in the bigger cap names, but more in, in, in the smaller cap names, because we see some multiples that are very interesting. Consider the fact that our understanding of, of the oil supply demand is that there is a lot of capex that need to go in the industry just to maintain supply, let alone to increase. So you, you really need the companies putting capex to, to, to maintain oil production. And we see companies trading below five times EBITDA, which 
for sure are in a much more volatile sector than you know the midstream uh, subsector but the, the upside is really there and the need fundamentally of these companies is still there so this is uh, again a sector that we we, we like uh, as well and finally there are there is all the ecosystem of companies that work around the oil and gas sector which are the oil services companies some are also owning rigs and you know heavy machinery and these these companies have been gaining uh, quite some attention lately the, the valuation have increased a bit we are less bullish than we were a year ago on these names but definitely uh, also in this case you get a bit less volatility and somewhat a certainty of the utilization rate of their equipment and their you know manpower for the foreseeable future given this uh, increased demand for oil at enhanced value fund we like to travel between the subsectors depending on where we see value so you know this very conversation we are having we are having today might be quite different in 3 6 months time evaluation readjust and for for some some reason change uh you know between big cap and small cap Sometimes things change quite quickly. Usually small cap, you know, lag, but sometimes, you know, in, when the market is super hot, they go ahead of themselves. And we sometimes also uh, kind of took position in the commodity itself uh, as a edge against our equity exposure or as a diversification out of the uh, equity that we have uh, in the portfolio. Uh, a, bit, uh, a bit of a uh, trying to run through many things at... Uh, uh, in one go, but hope this uh, makes sense. It does. And if the landscape changes, we can have uh, always uh, another podcast, maybe. So, I mean, like you, you touch a bit on that in your in your development here. Uh, but uh, can we uh, please focus on the uh, oil and gas uh, f- for a second? And um, could we have like a, an overlook of the oil prices? I mean, you were a trader at any before. And what are the drivers you see in the market, uh, especially? So I think the job, the, the trying to forecast the oil price is a bit of a full game. And, you know, I, you know, I used to be asked by, uh, you know, Reuters and uh, Bloomberg, uh, there were like Monday competition about who was getting closer to the Friday uh, settlement price for Brent and, and so forth. It's really, it's really impossible even more so than in the stock market. The shorter movement is is very difficult to predict. So I am surprised. What I can say is I'm surprised how low the oil price has been given the amount of uncertainty that we have and the fundamentally supply demand uh, scenario. If you are today an oil and gas company, you're struggling to find to finance projects. I mean, banks don't want to have loans on their balance sheets, uh, loans given to oil company. If you try to price a bond, if it is not an ESG bond, you pay a premium, you don't have a lot of interest for, for those bonds. I mean, there is still liquidity, but definitely is a hated kind of sector uh, of the market. So this lack of funding inevitably push the IRR of the projects higher because you don't fund projects that don't have very rich IRR and return on capital uh, because you don't have a lot of capital. You need to compete for these these kind of things. So I don't have a forecast, let's say, for 2024 for, for oil. But what I can tell is I think the below, let's say, $50, $60 per barrel, a lot of marginal production is not profitable. And therefore, that I think of that as a floor. Then the upside uh, that is for oil all the way to $100, $150, wherever, uh, you know, is going to average in the next, you know, three, four, five years is going to depend on how much capex the industry is going to put in, how much, you know, productivity the current equipment is going to be able to achieve and how much resources in terms of uh, it's very difficult also. There is a human resources crisis in the oil and gas industry. I mean, young kids out of university don't really want to join you know, an oil and gas company for good reason. So it's, um, it's very difficult for us to see three, five years' time with the oil demand forecasted to increase to 105 to 110 million barrel per day, whichever, you know, forecaster you pick in terms of volume. So like, let's say, you know, three to 
8 million barrels per day more oil is going to be needed uh, compared to what we today uh, are producing. It's very difficult in this scenario to, to foresee an, an abundance of oil. And I think that's also why, in part, savvy investors like uh, Warren Buffett are, are investing in, in, uh, in Occidental, in, in his case, uh, but in general in, in, in oil and gas, uh, because there is a lot of uh, risk of uh, uh, having scarcity. And you want, we all want to transition to renewable energy but we need to have an alternative. And, and that 80% that is fossil cannot switch overnight. So unfortunately, we can accelerate the, the transition, uh, but we cannot just switch the oil and gas sector. So it kind of shape as a, as a, as a kind of predictable uh, supply demand uh, scenario that we are, uh, we are keen to, to be invested in, in, in some shape or form. I see. Well, at least I, you're able to kind of like emphasize on some level of uh, pricing, like around the 60 uh, US dollar a barrel uh, that has an impact. Can you describe a little bit more uh, the impact exactly on the uh, corporate fundamentals, such as the EBITDA, and also like, according to you, where should like the multiples be for like oil companies? So, I mean, this is, of course, this is not investment advice, but I can, can tell you like what that enhanced value fund, what is our kind of thought process. The, so first off, there are, in oil and gas producing, there are certain countries that, uh, in the UK, for example, the taxes and royalties on oil producing companies are very high, I think 88 to 90%. So your, your uh, leverage to oil price is, uh, you know, linear with that drug. For other uh, situations, other jurisdictions, and, and specifically in the, in the US uh, example, you know, in case of the US shale, you pay, you know, once you develop the land to a certain extent, the proceeds that you get from that land are, are your own proceeds. So if your cost of producing oil is like 50, 60 dollars, uh, say it's 60, if you produce 70, if the price of oil is 70, you know, you make $10. If the price of oil is 80, you make double that, right? So you have an exponential exposure. I'm, I'm simplifying a bit, but I, I just want to give the the idea that not all the barrels around the world have the same economics, even though the hydrocarbons chain within the liquid is the same. So economically, you know, you want to be, if you think that the floor for oil prices is not far from where it's trading now, then, you know, you want to be exposed to the upside. And currently you have at uh, 70, 80 dollars, you have many companies trading at uh, five times single digit EBITDA. And in a scenario when oil goes to $9 per barrel, you know, $100 per barrel, then you have the inflection. And then you, you talk about tripling the EBITDA. And then most likely when the EBITDA is going to triple, the multiple and the valuation are going to expand as well. So you're going to get, a, you know, 5x, 7x, you know, your kind of money. And that can happen, you know, organically or it can happen because you have a U.S., a, a Middle East crisis. You know, we, we all read about the shipping disruption and you can have, you know, a war in the Middle East that escalate. The, the good thing about, you know, North American, Canadian production is that you produce oil in jurisdictions that are much more safer than other jurisdictions. So you get this double plus. Uh, and uh, unless uh, uh, there are some crazy ruling, uh, WTI and Brent should trade more or less, uh, you know, in close proximity. And so we think that's a good exposure uh, to have. It's also an insurance against some of the geopolitical crises that might happen. Certainly uh, makes sense. A final, final question. Uh, could you let us more on the uh, dividend yield and how to classify the landscape of oil and gas companies? As I mean, there must be like so many different profiles to understand for for a savvy investor. There, we look at uh, so one one thing about uh, dividend that you know we don't particularly like is the taxation. So we we are incorporated in in Singapore, and uh, you know U.S. companies are eligible for withholding tax. So any dividend that we get from U.S. companies are uh, subject to 30% withholding tax. 
So if a company pay 10% dividend, uh, we get all the international investors get 7% net uh, dividend. So we, we look at how companies return capital and we look at uh, the free cash flow yields, which is the basically operating cash flow after capex that the company has at disposal and can decide what to do. Then uh, they can do reinvest partially in the business, do buybacks or do dividend. So the dividend for the is tax inefficient for non uh, specifically for non US uh, uh, investors. There are companies outside the US that don't have this problem, even if they're listed in the US because their incorporation is outside the US. But what we really focus more than on dividend yield is uh, free cash flow yield. And uh, we, we like under different price scenario to have companies that are protected in case of low prices, they don't go bankrupt, they don't have a lot of debt, but when they, they have leverage exposure to oil price and uh, when the oil price goes up or gas price goes up, they have a lot of cash to distribute. And then hopefully they're going to distribute wisely. Even the current nation definitely prefer share buybacks because it's an enhancement of the return over time and doesn't have the, the kind of uh, uh, tax drag that we mentioned. In, uh, in the midstream subsector, which is the one that historically typically pay the highest dividend, it's even more true. And, uh, you know, the, we, we consider shipping as midstream. And in the shipping uh, industry, there are some uh, Norwegian company that are, uh, there are quite a few Norwegian company because it's a big market for shipping. And the taxation on their dividends is, uh, is, is zero. So you get these 10, 15, 20%, depending on the current yield that they pay, tax-free, which is a great uh, you know, return compared to a US listed uh, with holding 30% penalization. So that, that, that's a bit uh, how we think about the, the dividend yield. Understood. And uh, we are reaching out to uh, the end of this podcast. So Stefano Grasso, Portfolio Manager at Enhanced Value Fund in Singapore. Thank you very much for joining today. So thanks again. Uh, and thanks uh, all for listening. Absolutely. Thank you, Guillaume. Thank you. Happy trading ahead. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to IBKR Podcasts. As always, we have more episodes at ibkrpodcasts.com. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com. We offer more trading education material, such as webinars at ibkrwebinars.com, financial and economic commentary at tradersinsight.news, market-related courses at tradersacademy.online, and quant-related articles at ibkrquant.com. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry or sector trends, or other broad-based economic or political conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments, those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell, or hold such investments. The material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives, or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and is necessary, seek professional advice. Features are not suitable for all investors. The amount you may lose may be greater than your initial investment. Before trading futures, please read the CFTC Risk Disclosure. A copy and additional information are available at ibkr.com. The information in this podcast does not constitute tax advice and cannot be used by the recipient or any other taxpayer to avoid penalties under any federal, state, local, or other tax statutes or regulations or to resolve any tax issue. 